is a thing that's generally associated with React, but it doesn't have to be. There are implementations for other things. I think there's one for Angular as well. Though I haven't looked that much into it. So let's start with what it is. And what it is is a philosophy first and a framework second. This is really important to understand because Redux is actually a really small library. It's like less than two kilobytes. I think under 100 lines of code. I'm not too sure, but around there. Uh, so the main thing behind it is how you implement it and how it changes the way you define your app. So this is taken straight from uh, GitHub. This is what Redux calls itself, a predictable state container. So I'm going to talk a bit about what this means. And when we see this, we think about two different things. One is the predictability, which is an adjective modifying the noun of state container. So let's think about state and what that means. State's basically data that uh, defines a condition of a system, in this case, your app. So if, uh, let's say, you had to-do list items or Facebook posts and stuff, that would all be state, and your app would like, sort of revolve around it. Like state is the sun, and your app is a solar system. So the problem with state is that it's kind of everywhere. Uh, for most things, like it's the sauce and the spaghetti, and then the spaghetti is your app. It's just like hard to disentangle from the rest of your application. So yeah, once again, it's like a Jackson Pollock painting. Uh, so what's wrong with messy state? This there's actually like this huge problem with it, and the problem is just that it's hard to debug. Uh, so generally, when like I'm trying to de debug Angular, I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of like this. Like, I just cannot figure out where the bugs are coming from, and it's, it doesn't help a lot. Um, so this is where predictability comes in. Predictability for Redux is basically you can tell what's going to happen, right? That's what predictability means. So how is Redux's state management more predictable than like any other way of storing state? Uh, you're going to have to trust me on this, but I'll get into it later. But basically, you can be certain about your current state, and you can be certain about how specific actions you take will modify that state or will change that state. So it achieves this through two principles. One is the principle of abstraction, and the other one is the principle of immutability. So in terms of abstraction, we've got two things going here. One is uh, the state container itself. There's only like one place where your state resides. It's a singular state container. There's only one state container. Like, you will never have direct access to this. It will actually be in something called a store. But essentially, there's only one state object. Uh, like, for example, here, this is how I, would, I was going to make this game making where two people competitively try and memorize words at the same time. So like, um, in Angular, this would be broken up into a bunch of different stuff, like factories and controllers and stuff like that. For Redux, it's sort of all in one place. So you always know where it is. Uh, so you don't have to search for it anymore. It's just there. The other way it implements abstraction is that there is no direct contact. You never directly touch the state. Instead, what you do is you tell the store, which contains the state, that you want to do specific actions. And what the store will do is it'll take the current state, um, look at what it is, perform that action, and output a brand new state. And this new state is now the current state. So. When we look at the signature of something like this, we notice that it takes two things, a state and action, and outputs a new state. That's like a reducer function. And this is where Redux gets its name from. Redux is basically reducers plus flux. I'm not going to go into what flux is, but it's, um, it's React's way of managing state, basically. So the second principle of staying immutable. Basically, you just never modify the state. Whenever you make state changes like this, those are two different objects. Uh, and you might ask why this is the case. It seems kind of weird to duplicate an object just for one small change. Uh, the reason is simply that it's certain. You can know for sure that these are two different states. And there's a lot you can do off of that. And it gets pretty interesting. Like, you realize that if there's, these are two different states, then they're different from each other. And you can kind of swap between them really easily. So this brings me to development tools. And I've made a pretty simple app to show this. Essentially, it's just a counter. And you can increment the counter, and so on and so forth. So like, as I increment the counter, the state, let me just make that bigger. The state changes. And to add complexity to this app, I've also included authentication. And I've made a, s a special condition. 
in which if the user is logged in and the value shown on the counter is 10, then the value changes to woohoo instead of like 10. So I can test that right now. Value is 10, I'm logging in. I've logged, still logging in. It's OAuth. Sorry guys, give me a sec. This is odd, it was working. Okay, there we go. So, log in. Yep. So essentially, this is it, right? This is woohoo. Let's, let's just imagine that we started off at this state. So in this case, like the user is logged in and the value is 10. But if I wanted to check whether the user was logged in and the value is 9 and see whether or not the value would be 9 or woohoo, let's say I'm not sure it's working right. So normally what you'd have to do is you'd have to like restart your whole app and then you'd have to go to 9 and then you'd have to press login. But what Redux does is it allows you to, serial, uh, to sort of like see your state like this. These are increments, increments, increments. And if I just like cancel out that login, I'm no longer logged in. And then if I just cancel out one of the increment actions, it goes down. Uh, so yeah, the thing we're testing right now is whether or not you can be logged in and it still shows 9. There we go. I'm logged in and it still shows 9. So this is a bit of a contrived example, but imagine something where you're testing, say you're making Avalon, and uh, you've got to click a lot of places and just get to the exact state you want, and then you realize that you messed up one thing. What you would do is normally restart your app, but with uh, tools like this, which are available because Redux has a specific philosophy of how you manage state, with tools like this, you can just like cancel out actions or add new actions, and it's great. So yeah. Let's uh, just play a quick game of does it mutate. So I'm going to ask you guys, like this is an array of 1, 2, 3. If I do r.push4, does it mutate? The array? Yeah. Yeah, OK, yeah, it does. So don't do that for if you're managing state. Um, there's actually a great library you can use called immutable that helps you deal with things in this particular way, where like it wraps arrays and objects and stuff like that in other objects that when you call methods on them, they don't mutate but they just like return new objects. I'm not going to go into that so much, but yeah. If you don't want to use it, you can do stuff like this, or you can use ES6 spread operators to return new arrays, or array.concat returns new arrays. The idea is just don't modify the objects. So yeah, I'm just going to end off with this, and this is like how state changes in Redux. The idea is the data changes. You then call an action based on that, and you tell the store to perform an action. And then the store calls a reducer on the old state and the action, and then it gets like a new state from that. And then it swaps out the reference for the current state to be like the new state. And then that's how it knows. Uh, yeah, that's all I got.